practice and pitfalls of popularizing history for a younger generation and what is gained and altered in that translation. We will do so looking across the Hope House exhibition at the Blaffer, the place of Anne Frank at the Holocaust Museum of Houston, as well as the book that one of our panelists has written, uh, Salvage Pages. And they will discuss how the Anne Frank story has been reformatted over the decades and how the new questions circulate within history in the museum setting. So if you'll allow me, I'm gonna give just a brief uh, biographical introduction to each of our panelists today. And these are very distinguished panelists. So I'm making a very brief selection just so that we can keep uh, the discussion moving. Um, but I'm gonna start with Dr. Mary Lee Wiebeck um, of the Holocaust Museum, who served uh, on the faculty of the University of Texas at Austin and joined the Holocaust Museum in 2006 as the Director of Education. She now serves as the Holocaust and Genocide Education Endowed Chair at the Boniex Center for the Future of Holocaust, Human Rights and Genocide Studies at the HMH. Um, Alexandra Zapruder is curated the permanent exhibition and Still I Write, Young Diarists on War and Genocide that opened at the Holocaust Museum Houston in 2019. She wrote the acclaimed 2002 book, Salvage Pages, Young, Writer, Young Writer's Diaries of the Holocaust. And she also wrote and co-produced I'm Still Here, a documentary film for young audiences based on her book, which aired on MTV in 2005. She serves as the education director of the Defiant Requiem Foundation in Washington, DC, and also sits on the board of directors for the Educators Institute for Human Rights. And last but not least, Simon Fujiwara is a British Japanese artist currently based in Berlin, who regularly investigates themes of popular desire, such as tourist attractions, famous icons, celebrities, the conversation between education and entertainment and mass media. Hope House is an ongoing exhibition built upon years of study into the legacy of Anne Frank, her ascension from a regular girl to a renowned histo historical figure provides a case study, lens, and continuum for Simon to investigate today's socio-political media scape. And so we're gonna start the discussion today with a brief presentation by Simon, who's going to give you a little insight into his extended work studying um, Anne Frank to begin the discussion. So I'm gonna hand it off to Simon. Oh, Simon, you're on mute. Okay, can you hear me now? Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, I am going to just hopefully prepare this so that you can see. Um, I'm gonna give you, a, can, I, can you see this PowerPoint presentation? Um, I'm just gonna give you like a five minute super galloping introduction to the exhibition and some of the concerns, just as a framing for our conversation um, uh, between the three of us, which is going to elaborate, I think, on some of the the themes that come out of it. But um, um, I, it was never my plan to work with with the legacy of Anne Frank. I'm not um, Jewish. I don't have any kind of personal history related to um, the story, and I don't have a, a personal family history related to the Holocaust. I suppose the closest thing is that I live in Berlin and in Europe, and it's a story, of course, that has massively impacted. The city and and the narrative of of Europe in my lifetime, um, but I went to visit the Anne Frank House, and um, partly because it was such an image of a place um, that I'd had in my mind, and I was it wasn't until I was an adult that I went there and thought I have such a clear idea of this attic that Anne Frank lived in because I thought Anne Frank lived in an attic, um, and that this museum would be this kind of dusty cobweb place where you just sort of see this. Um, hiding place has just been uncovered and um, of course when I got there it was very different to what I imagined it was there was a huge queue outside there's over a million visitors going there every year and um, it's a time essentially it's a tiny um, Dutch house um, um, in which a small uh, family and and some acquaintances live for two years hiding in a very small space which now has to take a million people every year going through this tiny hiding space which is kind of an absurd concept, a place that would be about extreme privacy um, would actually become this mass, mass public um, space, of, uh, space of spectacle. 
Um, and I became interested when I was there in how the house had been renovated because the house was bought after the Hollywood film was made. Um, and um, there wasn't enough funds um, or enough public interest for the house to be turned into a museum until um, a certain point in the late 50s. And by that time, of course, there'd been several, several years that the house was not kept as the Anne Frank family had left it. The main building was used as offices. And so architects had to renovate the house to, to bring it back to the state it was in when the Frank family lived there. Um, and famously, Anne Frank's father, who's in, in the image here, said that he didn't want a restaging. He didn't want the bed and the, you know, the glasses on the bed and the burnt candle and the book and things left just so as we sometimes see in these reconstructions of, of historic houses because he didn't want visitors to attach themselves to the personal narrative of the museum, but to the grander narrative, which was that of the destructive nature of the Holocaust and of discrimination in general. Um, however, his you know, noble efforts, I think, to, to keep that sort of more academic line, um, it sort of rules out the fundamental humanity is that people just love this story of this girl Anne, and they do totally fetishize her and they come from all over the world just to see where she slept and you know people would love to see the sunglasses the you know, the reading glasses and the bed and the pen and even if it was fake um so there is a tension there and um and i was interested in in to what extent one receives that kind of entertainment experience in a place that really is a very solemn and serious kind of a monument to a, a, a tragic history. There's moments in the house, such as the bedroom, where you see um, images that Anne Frank had put on the wall of, of um, celebrities, and you sort of get this encounter with Anne that you sort of feel you're being promised in some ways or desire. Um, and then there's, of course, um, many other parts of the museum that are more about the Holocaust. Um, how does this museum navigate this tension between the hyper-personal, the, the ce almost celebrity status that Anne Frank has and, and this um, message that they want to give to the world, which is what Otto Frank, the father, was, was wanting to establish the museum for? Um, well, in the most bizarre way I found was in the gift shop where one could um, buy, for example, this diary, which is a, a remake of... Anne Frank's diary, it's got a similar design to it, this tartan edge, and it's a blank diary um, that encourages you to write your own um, diary in a kind of facsimile of Anne Frank's. And um, this made me very uncomfortable. I thought, you know, of course, I thought immediately about myself. And I said, what on earth am I going to, would I write in, in this diary that could ever match the historic gravity of what Anne Frank was going through? And, um, you know, I'm not... Um, an oppressed minority living under a brutal fascist regime right now. Um, <laughs> that could easily happen quite soon, I think, which has been the lesson of the last few months. Um, but, um, um, you know, how can one match um, this experience? And why is this book being sold? Um, indeed, why is there also a cardboard model that you can build yourself of the Anne Frank house in, in one to 60 scale? Um, where, which, you know, I bought both of these items and I went back to my studio and I started building this house and had this very perverse experience of, well, first having an experience of this. Why should I have the experience of putting Anne Frank's bedroom wall into place and, you know, flipping the cardboard and finding out where the toilet was and, all, you know, these intimate things. Um, having this also uncomfortable experience conceptually of restaging essentially what the Gestapo did, which is, rediscovering the house, peering into it, looking through these empty walls and being a voyeur into the life of, of people who genuinely just wanted to hide. Um, they, they were not in there. They were not, you know, bloggers who were pretending to hide and wanting to secretly be famous. They were hiding, you know, but now they're super famous and we have simulacras and models and books and films and replicas of people who were trying to hide. Um, and so I took all of this and, um, and many other stories from the house and think, started to think about how interesting the Anne Frank house really is as an artifact um, of our times in which we are dealing, grappling with mass popular interest in these hyper authentic stories 
as we feel increasingly authenticity is sort of being lost from us in this digital age, we go back to the past and we find these stories and we want to go to the real place and smell these spaces and be in the rooms that, that Anne Frank was in. And, um, and um, what it is then that happens when we pair that with um, products and capitalism and great things like democracy and sharing and, um, and participation, which is what this diary, which says, let's participate, let's write our own stories, let's write our own histories. This model, which says, let's not just think of this place as a monument, but let's interact with it and think about how it's really built and who lived where and how and um, what all of that means. And it's a kind of, it's a great big mess and it was a big tangle for me. So I thought, well, why not build it why not remake it and talk about this tangle and this mess? And so what we see at the Blatha Museum is a kind of um, a blown up reconstruction of a fragments of, of the Anne Frank house as the model um, um, would be as a kind of giant thing, um, architecture you can walk into. It's obviously very fake, it's very much a similar, it doesn't pretend to be authentic. And yet it talks about this story, which is one of the most authentic, authentic stories we have. You know, it's a story that we just, it's, it's not a story that is open to critique. Um, we don't say how good was Anne Frank's writing or how authentic was her writer's voice. Um, she died and it was tragic and it's sacred, her story, and it should be. Um, but there's so much industry around it that has made it known to us and has elevated it to that point. Um, and so I wanted to show really the construct of the industry around it. And I think um, showing it in this kind of simulacra of a, of a model house that the Anne Frank house themselves produced and um, was sort of my strategy to do that. And so um, that is, um, that's my brief introduction and that's what is on show at the um, Blatha Museum. And I'm just gonna exit my screen now and um yeah i think we're gonna have another little presentation if i believe that's right great thank you thank you so much simon yes and so obviously you can see the way that simon has framed or examined Anne's life through a very contemporary lens and this got us thinking of how does the framing of Anne frank affect one's education or learning or experience of the holocaust as well as the contemporary moment and so I want to hand it over to uh, Mary Lee at the, at the Holocaust Museum to kind of give the overview of how the HMH frames both Anne Frank as well as the contemporary political moment. Okay, let's start my slides, please, Alexandra. Okay, um, this is a beautiful nighttime photo of um, the corner where Holocaust Museum Houston is located in the museum district in Houston. We are a place that was founded by Holocaust survivors uh, 25 years ago now to preserve the memory of the Holocaust, to educate about the Holocaust. And um, a number of years ago, other genocides were added to our mission. Today, our mission is greatly expanded about being a um, a central place in our city where people can convene, where they can learn, where they can ask questions and ask new questions. And they can also come together to talk about difficult times. And I wanted to um, frame our extraordinary discussion today in the moment we exist right now. So next slide, please. Um, I am a follower of the Southern Poverty Law Center, and I have been for a number of years. Every year they um, publish an intelligence report, which is about their tracking of hate groups in the United States of America. And this is a map in which you can see represented a number of different kinds of hate groups. And you can see our um, state of Texas, as well as other states where um, audience members are represented uh, from today. Um, I wanted you to see this as a start because what we're talking about today is fully present in our world and in our needs. Next slide. Um, we wanna talk about historical accuracy today and Simon's already brought uh, that subject up as well as Stephen has. 
Um, I wanted to show you a, a, a photograph that some of you may have seen attributed to um, what took place at the Capitol, the insurrection nine days ago now. Um, if you are not familiar with this, the lettering on the shirt, um, this stands for a um, expression and a way of thinking that is uh, present in many extremist groups uh, operating in the United States and in other parts of the world. Uh, 6MWE stands for the idea that 6 million weren't enough. Um, as I said, this, this uh, image is attributed to this guy being at the Capitol. Instead, he, uh, this photo was taken on December 12th of last year uh, when the Proud Boys were um, doing a, uh, a walk in Washington. So what it did take place in Washington. Uh, behind uh, him, over his shoulder, you can see another T-shirt worn um, during this walk that says Proud Boys DC Sweet Sweepers 2020. Um, I, I wanted us to, to look at this today because 6MWE relates so specifically to anti-Semitism and to the importance of thinking about the role of extremism and the role of all of us in asking questions. Next slide, please. Um, this is an image from the Capitol insurrection. Um, one of the things that I think is amazing about this is what's up in the tree, who is up in the tree, um, what you see in the image surrounding, what the context of this is, all of the flags that you see here representing different ways of thinking, uh, different values, different perspectives. Um, we are a country of democracy, although we have recently, after this event, lost our standing as the longest standing democracy in the world. Um, however, we are a, a, a country that believes in the importance of individual voice, and you certainly see um, that being projected here. Next slide, please. Another graphic image from the Capitol, um, the noose, which in American history has a long standing emphasis on hatred and extremism and extreme violence. Uh, the man wrapped in the Trump flag, the Capitol, uh, very, very chilling moment. Um, a noose on Capitol Hill, this, this image is um, captioned as this is America. Next slide. Um, the Anti-Defamation League um, has recently published this map of the United States, which shows, again, a distribution of different extremist groups, uh, including incidents of hate crimes, of hate murders, um, and of anti-Semitism. Look at the numbers of, of these dots on this map and the differing sizes which um, portray the number of events in certain areas. Uh, here in Houston, in Texas, we are certainly not um, misaligned with this map. We are fully present in its action. And I wanted you all to think about this today as we have this very, very important discussion about asking questions and thinking about our stance in history. Next slide. And I wanted to end here because one of my jobs at Holocaust Museum Houston um, and one of my jobs as a college professor and as a thinker has always been to think about how to have critical discussions with audiences. When I looked at the pictures that were being shown from the Capitol, I looked so closely at the faces of the people that were taking part in the insurrection I looked at their eyes, if I could see them. I looked at whether or not they were wearing masks. And I, I looked at the gender of the, most of the constituents. This image is also taken from the Proud Boys March on Washington in December. And when I look at this image, this is, um, these are the people that I have to think about how to message to 
how do you talk to people that think absolutely in an opposite perspective than you hold yourself? How do you open yourself to these kinds of hurts and discussions and values? Um, and, and, and I think that um, I'm so privileged to be here today with um, my colleagues as we talk about Simon's exhibit because he is opening new ways of thinking. The title of our discussion, Asking New Questions, part of the title, it is what we all have to do right now as people, as museums. Um, as a museum, we have to be a town square where people can come and talk to each other, uh, where people can express emotion, as Simon talked about, um, where people can share their perspective and, and have value. Um, this is a great challenge and in a country that aspires to be democratic and aspires to regain our position uh, in the world's view. I think that we all have our work in front of us and I, and I look forward to sharing this time with you today. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Mary Lee. Um, so obviously you can see the way that the Holocaust Museum places history into the contemporary moment um, and works with and thinks about the legacy of the Holocaust. And so one of the major sort of gestures on that behalf was to commission um, Alexandra Zapruder to curate an exhibition based around diaries written during the Holocaust. And so I now want to hand it over to her to think both about the exhibition that she curated as well as sort of the larger framing of Anne Frank within her work as an author and an educator. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, everyone. I'm so glad to be here today. Um, if you can start my slides, I've got just a very small number of them and I'm gonna speak briefly so that we can get to the, um, to the conversation part as soon as possible. This is an image that represents the cover of um, my book, Salvaged Pages. And, you know, this is a book that's been out for nearly 20 years now. This is a book that really grew out of questions that I had about Anne Frank and the Diary of Anne Frank, um, being on the st founding staff of the Holocaust Museum in DC um, as a fresh out of college graduate. And um, I began doing research on the subject of young writers' Holocaust diaries. And as I did, I was sort of struck by two things. One was how many other diaries there were besides the Diary of Anne Frank that I, I didn't know about. And how often I heard this very familiar refrain around um, Anne Frank's diary and other diaries that were published, which was essentially a redemptive one. The idea that the writer lives on um, through his or her diary, that the writer speaks for an entire lost generation and that the writer, somehow the survival of the diary um, represents a sort of um, something fundamentally hopeful. And in the case of Anne Frank, her um, expression of personal hope stands for the hope that we all should have um, hope for humanity um, and, and the future and, um, and, and life in general, these very broad kind of sweeping statements. And I really wanted to take that on in this book, not only by sharing more diaries, but also trying to really interrogate those redemptive ideas and, and present these diaries in a, in a way that honors what they contribute to the historical and literary record in a more concrete way rather than a symbolic one. So I think that's something that we'll probably come back and, and talk about. Um, if you could go to the next slide. This is an image that shows uh, part of the exhibition that I curated um, in partnership with Mary Lee and my colleagues at Holocaust Museum Houston. And the important thing here is that while I had up until this time spent however many years, 17 years or more studying the diaries of young people in the Holocaust, it felt very important for this exhibition in this museum, in this moment, to expand to include the writings of young people in other wars and genocides, including um, the siege of Sarajevo in Bosnia, um, including a diary kept during the war in Iraq, another one kept um, under ISIS um, in Raqqa, and also non-Jewish writers in World War II and a young man who was a 
um, interned in a Japanese American internment camp in Wyoming. So the idea here was to bring these questions to still broader areas and, and contemporary contexts so that we sort of make connections between these conversations that we so often have around the Holocaust and other forms of genocide and war that have occurred in, in the recent past. So if you could go to the next slide. Um, here's Anne Frank. We did, and I'm gonna just briefly say, because I'd like to talk about this as a group, we did present Anne Frank and her diary in our exhibition um, from the point of view of the way that it was framed in 1952 America when the diary was published. And I think there's an important distinction to be made between her diary as it was written and her diary as it was framed and, and presented to the American people when it came out in 1952. And, and that was very important to say. So I think we'll, we'll come back to that. And I think the last slide, if you can just briefly show is, is it just another image of a group of um, kids clustered around uh, one of these stations in the exhibition reading from the diary of a young girl. I think this is from Nadia. I can't, Read it, writing in Bosnia. So just a, a last image there. Thanks. Um, I think what's really, um, what's really interesting is thinking about um, the way Anne Frank sits in a landscape of other diarists. Mm -hmm. what, what she provides, which is obviously hugely positive in many ways, but what we never talk about is what the popularity of Anne Frank has done negatively, <laughs> which is a taboo, of course. It's a taboo to, to think or talk about that Sim in very much in the ways that you framed at the beginning, which is the idea that we need this narrative. We need this dominant, hopeful narrative so much. And I'll give you one example, which is um, I'm half Japanese and and Frank after America, Japan is the largest um, consumer of the Anne Frank diary. They're the biggest, um, they buy the most Anne Frank diaries. And when I spoke to the director of the Anne Frank house and asked him why he thought that was, you know, he said, well, you know, Anne Frank is ketchup. That's the word he used actually, mm. which is, and I said, what do you mean? And he said, if you put ketchup on a dish, everything tastes of ketchup. And, you know, we all, I know very well that Japan has not dealt with its Second World War legacy at all. But there's an Anne Frank Museum <laughs> in Japan, it talks about Anne Frank, it doesn't talk about the, the atrocities that the Japanese did during the Second World War. Um, and so Anne Frank is used as a kind of mascot to roll out the Second World War story. And when I think about that, you know, when I started to think about that in the context of Japan, where it's like, well, they love cute things in Japan. They love, there's this kawaii culture. And you know what, Anne Frank is incredibly photogenic. You know, the moment you put that image up of that slide, you know, everyone just goes like, oh, look at her, <laughs> her desk. Even your voice changed actually, Alexandra, when you were talking about how you kind of sounded like more cutesified somehow. It's, she has this incredible effect and that is a kind of star quality that some people have. And of course, that is like expanded on by the, the films and the hysteria around Anne Frank. Well, but there was a kind of cosmic mix with her. And I, I suppose one of the, and it's, one can sound very cynical saying this because it it's, sounds brutal, you know, it's not her fault. Um, she didn't choose this path necessarily, but I would be curious, what, in what ways do you see that it co creates challenges to your work? And that's also kind of a question to Mary Lee, because that was... Yeah. Something you spoke about recently. I, I, I want to jump in here and um, be the bad guy, the devil's advocate, and mm. tell you that there is a whole school of um, Holocaust thought that, um, and, and one of the most famous scholars who is probably the originator of this thought is a man who's in his 90s now. His name is Lawrence Langer. Uh, he's one of my most respected mentors and historians of the Holocaust. He says Anne Frank's story and diary is not about the Holocaust and should not be used as an example of the Holocaust because 
of the way it has been used in many, many, many cases and in many, many educational settings where the diary is read as an intact piece without all of the context that surrounds it. So if you don't know what happens after Anne Frank is um, liberated from her home and sent into deportation um, and into uh, different prison settings, you don't understand the full context of the story. Um, and many, many, many young people are taught the diary of Anne Frank and they resonate with her hopefulness in, in parts of it. And this becomes a problem, um, you know, and this is why your exhibit challenging in many ways the iconic status and posing questions about the hows and whys um, of, of this representation are in my mind, so important. So thank you for that. And Alex, I don't know what you want to well, add. Well, yeah, I have a lot to say about this. Obviously, this is, um, you know, right right in my, my, you know, something that I've spent a lot of time thinking about. I will say that, um, you know, Anne Frank has become familiar. She has become sort of ours in a way. And so, when I noticed that my voice changed and it, and it reflects, I think, that sense of intimacy that we have with her diary. Mm -hmm. um, this sense that um, there's a fondness and a familiarity around her. I also use that same voice actually often when I'm talking about other diaries of writers whose work I love. Um, a kind of tenderness for her and them and for their, the tragedy of their lives and also protectiveness over the story. Um, but I think that, you know, what Mary Lee says is, is exactly right about Lawrence Langer. And I would also say that I have disagreed with Larry Langer in, in some ways. <laughs> I don't agree that Anne Frank's diary should not be used um, as a Holocaust record. I think that what has happened is that the, there's sort of the Anne Frank is everything or Anne Frank is nothing. You know, Anne Frank represents she's the point of entry and the be all and end all to learn about the Holocaust or she, her, or the Cynthia Ozick um, essay, you know, and her diary should have been burned and would have been better if nobody had ever read it for all the damage it did culturally. And my whole thing is, and I even want to take on something that you said, Simon, about her diary being sacred. These are historical records and her diary and every diary by a young person or an adult for that matter that survived they're, they're sacred the way that any historical record is sacred. They, they stand for something that happened in the past. They are a fragment that sheds light on a historical reality, but they are also all partial records. And of course, Anne Frank, you know, I always say this, I've said it so many times, I, you know, people are probably sick of hearing me say it, but if you wanna know what it was like to live with your family in hiding in Amsterdam, during the Holocaust, there is no better record than Anne Frank, period, full stop. Mm -hmm. But if you want to know what it was like to be in a ghetto in Vilna or in Kovno or Warsaw, or to be in hiding in a bunker in Poland, or to be fleeing as, on the kinder transport, um, then Anne Frank's diary is not your source. And I think it's so much of it for me, at least in salvage pages and in these years and years and years of writing and thinking about this has been elevating the historical and literary significance and de-escalating the language of sort of, um, of sacredness that, that makes it so that we cannot criticize or we cannot discuss. I mean, Anne Frank was an amazing writer. She's a better writer than average. And there are other writers who wrote diaries who are better than average. And there are some whose writings are important historical sources, but are not frankly all that interesting to read or are tedious or long or boring or rambling, but they still count as historical records of the time. So that's that's sort of my, and my I, way of- And I wanna that. jump back in and, and give yeah. Larry Langer a little positive note here, because he's a really amazing guy. He is amazing, nothing against Larry Langer. He did say, or he has said on numerous occasions, that Anne Frank's diary is an example of beautiful writing by a young person that explains her situatedness. So, uh, you know, so there is credit for that. And 
And part of a, another project that Alex and I are working on is thinking about how to collect the writings of young people and how to value them in our current world, how, how to give um, credence to the fact that young writers can share so much with us that we can't envision at whatever our ages are if we are not that person. So, um, yeah. So I, just I didn't answer your question, Simon. So if you don't mind my taking one okay. more minute because you asked, you asked this question about how does it make the work harder? Mm -hmm. um, do you want me to still answer that? I don't want to yes, dominate. I, do. I think that, um, yes, I'd love okay. to hear. Yeah, I mean, because I think it's, I think your question is, is such an interesting one. I mean, mm -hmm. in many ways, Anne Frank's diary makes everything easier when it comes to the experiences of young people because the framing has already been done. The point of entry already exists, right? Everybody knows what you're talking about. But in other ways, I think you're quite right to ask the question, you know, what makes it harder is that these beliefs about the meaning of the diary are so entrenched. The belief that Anne Frank um, sort of, that Anne Frank's life is, is preserved for immortality in her diary and that Anne Frank spoke for all the children who were murdered during the Holocaust, not merely for herself and that her hopefulness should be in some moral way, our hopefulness, those become obstacles to real understanding. And, and I think that is something that, you know, again, I tried to tackle in Salvage Pages and I continue to try to tackle in my work. And I think it's something that you tried to tackle in your exhibition, this idea that, you know, these are, these are cultural frameworks and they are cultural frameworks that were very appropriate in 1952 and that that absolutely must continue to be dismantled as times change and the world changes and we read these records in our own time in a completely different context. I think one of the things that drew me to um, looking at Anne Frank now, because it's not really a subject that you think is a super hot subject for a contemporary artwork, you know, right. it's, it's rife with problems and it's not something I went into thinking people are going to be really interested in this. It was just, because um, also my generation grew up with Anne Frank as a part of nature, you know, it was like, she's almost like a washing machine or an apple or a window. Mm. She's just been there. The word Anne Frank has been in your mind since you were a child. Yeah. So yeah. there's been no world before her. She's almost like a natural existing <laughs> phenomenon. So that I never thought of her as a construct, mm. you know, and, and, I think there's something was that was really interesting to me is that even before our time now of this quite extreme positioning of, you know, and cancel culture and, you know, people really backing something with deep passion that is based on information we don't really know much about <laughs> and ident hyper identifying with causes and people and um, that was happening with Anne Frank kind of even before the internet, you know, it was like a cause that was like, you know, if someone offended the memory of Anne Frank, that would have been in the newspapers, <laughs> you know, it's not, and now the internet has sort of come and, and it, it happens every day. Um, and just seeing that as a template of something that people would stand behind and fight and what kind of um, passion that a figure like Anne Frank can evoke in people because of how simply she is presented to us, mm -hmm. you know, and that being such a very, such a similar metaphor for how everything is nowadays, including your president <laughs> currently, <laughs> you know, they get things are boiled down to this extreme simplicity and how powerful and how much we want that as humans somewhere deep in us, you know, <laughs> We, right, we desire why, this, clearly we desire this, which is why Anne Frank has been such a successful picture lit on the jam jar that is the Second World War, you know? Right. And I think that's what, I mean, I think Mary Lee can talk to this too, but I think that's why, you know, so many of us in this field say to ourselves and in public day in and day out, you know, there are no simple answers to complicated questions. Our job is to complicate this history, not simplify this history. Our job is to, you know, ask, challenge our assumptions about, 
about this history. And, and you know, there is something terribly reductive about the way that we approach the Holocaust and, and genocide. And now, you know, I think that could be said about public discourse in general, mm -hmm. that it is reductive and therefore polarizing. Mm -hmm. And we are in, you know, as my father would say, deep yogurt as a result of it. Um, that's a major, that's a major problem that we face. Yeah. So I, I would like to um, ask my two colleagues and Stephen, three colleagues, to define a word that I love that I think isn't part of our vernacular of education quite enough. And that word is problematize. Mm -hmm. I think what Simon's exhibit does is problematize in such an articulate way um, ways to enter in. So what does that word mean to each of you? Simon? I, think, I mean, I love problems. <laughs> they're, the, they're, the, they're the truth, aren't they? Um, but I generally look, I mean, I love to see solutions, you know, and how problematic solutions are. So one of the problems I think of with um, is, is putting myself in different people's shoes. So I think, you know, of your job, you know, uh, Mary Lee, or anyone, let's say, being commissioned to do something that represents a Holocaust. And you just see it again and again. Everything is really quite spectacular. Mm -hmm. You know, every Holocaust museum is big. You know, the one in Berlin is star architect mm -hmm. designed. The Mon Memorial is huge. And it sort of has to be to meet the scale of the tragedy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That it, that it has somewhere, I mean, this is not across the board, there are smaller, more intimate Holocaust memorials, of course, and, um, but there, is a, a, there, there was a trend, at least, um, in the last decades of kind of these mega memorials. And I love to think about what, um, why the problems lie in that and why, why, it, why it needs to be met with that. And it's almost like, well, no, we need to make these really like huge concrete plazas that can never be destroyed again <laughs> to counteract the fragility of what, of what really happened. But it's, there's, it's a, like adding a problem onto a problem, you know, because we're, we're dealing then with, you know, creating new problems. It's just like, yeah, then, you know, you, uh, people love taking photos in the Holocaust Memorial because mm -hmm. the only place you get a lot of concrete you know, with, with top lighting and people look great in that context. <laughs> so you, you open any gay dating app and there's going to be a topless picture of someone in front of the Holocaust Memorial because it's the best lighting in Berlin. Oh my goodness. So, you know, like all of these things just cause prob more and more problems. So I I think that that excites me because it's, it's human and that's where the Anne Frank house as a problem was, was exciting to me. The idea that the wallpaper in the house was, um, you know, all, it was all re-wallpapered mm -hmm. from um, um, wallpaper that matched exactly that Anne Frank House wallpaper, but it was from communist German mm -hmm. factories. And if you had a sign at the front door that said, hi, this is the Anne Frank House, it's a symbol of resistance to the Nazi regime. We've wrapped the whole thing like a birthday gift in st Stasi DDR wallpaper. <laughs> That's a museum I want to go to. <laughs> because it's sort of like it talks about the compromises which is you know do we create recreate this perfect experience that really was a simulacre of what Anne Frank experienced and what are the ethical moral material compromises we have to make to do that and I think that's probably going to be the subject of our next part two of this discussion which is like simulacre and, and reconstruction right. um but that's a pro that's a problem that i just thought god we're missing that if 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 i could just if i had all day i'd stand outside the Anne Frank house and i'll tell everyone this is so much more interesting than you've been told yeah you know <laughs> there's so much more to it and more things that are applicable to your life now than mm. this little chocolate box of history that's like oh it was so bad what happened but she was so amazing where are we going for lunch? Right. I mean, I think it's interesting, Mary Lee, I think I love this question of what, you know, what does problematize make you think of or what does it mean? And to me, I think it's, you know, problematizing something to me is taking something that you don't, that one doesn't think is a problem 
and recognizing the problematic nature of it. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's like this thing that, um, that this, my rabbi actually, the synagogue that I grew up in used to always still says, um, you know, if it ain't broke, break it. Mm-hmm. You know, this idea that the, the most dangerous things are the things that we don't think are problems that we accept as a reality. And in a way, you know, that was very much what happened with, with my work for Salvaged Pages. It was somehow I was, became so offended by the framing of Anne Frank's diary, what made other people feel good, the triumph of the human spirit and Anne Frank living on in her diary and, you know, all of these kinds of things, it offended me. Why me? Why in that moment? Why did I have the particular response I did? I could, you know, speculate, but that gesture um, of, of problematizing, of taking something that we accept and looking at it and cocking our heads and saying like, huh, I wonder if that, if there's something that we're accepting here that maybe we shouldn't, I think is the, is the really, um, mm-hmm. that's the essential work that we have to be doing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and if I can just, Jen, thank you, Mary Lee, for the question, because it is a very provocative one. And, and I have to say, I've walked numerous people through Simon's exhibition here at the Blaffer, and the conversations are always very fruitful. This is what I want as a director and a curator for an exhibition to be a catalyst for thinking and conversation. Mm-hmm. I don't want people to just walk through and smile at pretty objects. Like I really want this to be something that is complex. And, and I often say, I don't say Simon's work, it's not iconoclastic, it's not irreverent. I find it to, and just the way, even that down to the labels that he writes when he mm-hmm. presents a number of other cultural artifacts from different moments in time, he presents them and lets you wrestle with the implications and squirm with the consequences, but doesn't direct you one way or the other. And I find that to be such a rich, yet uncomfortable and unsettling, but such a necessary experience. And, and I've just, I've felt, I've seen people, I've watched them, you know, and, and the way that these are not easy questions. And, you know, I think we'll have to probably postponed to another discussion, but Simon presents artifacts from other museums. We look at the Apartheid Museum in this mm-hmm. show. We look at the 9-11 Museum. And there are also questions that come up there. And, and I think they're very necessary ones, but they are never comfortable. Mm-hmm. And that probably makes them even more necessary. And that makes it good. Mm-hmm. I would just, I want to just jump in with one other thing, which, which perhaps will continue in our, in our second conversation, but um, Simon used the word authentic. Mm-hmm. And I feel like this is such an important topic to what is authenticity? And, and in, I think about this all the time because there's, there is this idea that um, these diaries, for example, the di- whether it's the Diary of Anne Frank or the other diaries that have been collected over the years, that they are authentic because they are untouched. Mm -hmm. right, that they are sort of, um, that they were produced in the the crucible of of a particular um, traumatic historical moment, and that that's what makes them real, authentic records. Never mind that lots of writers, including Anne Frank, most especially Anne Frank, wrote and rewrote and rewrote her diary to make it something that would be interesting to a reading public. But when you then sort of make the connection to the way that young people are recording their lives in the present day on social media and using um, social media to present themselves to the world, then the question of what is or isn't authentic um, and, and even how things that are inauthentic in a way like a selfie can be authentic because it's authentically inauthentic, you know, you start to sort of get into this like very meta kind of conversation about what is truth? What is representation? How do we represent ourselves? What is left behind in our lives? What do we leave? What fragments um, do we leave behind? And then how are we reconstructed? Um, You know, in some cases after death or in some cases during our lives, um, you know, by those records. So I think this is something that is endlessly fascinating to me. I think that, um, I think 
we should pick this up in part two, which is the, exactly this, because I think there's, there's a comparison I would like to make in between, and, and a discussion about um, Holocaust museums in general, um, the, and how certain experiences are created that are, you know, either have this hyper authentic basis to them, like piles of shoes, mm -hmm. you know, um, that are just like uh, unarguably tragic, and yet they're a pile of them, and they're presented in a certain way, and they're curated, and it's you just can't, you don't, you're not even allowed to let, you don't dare let yourself start thinking about certain things. Um, also in the Holocaust Museum in Houston, there's a, a, a train carriage, um, you know, what, what does it provide people to be put into those spaces that are real? Mm -hmm. What is it, how does it help? Um, or how does it detract, you know, do those things do a similar thing to the Anne Frank um, discussion we've been having, which is, well, it's great to be in that train carriage, but do you really learn more? Does it or should we should we all be addicted to this feeling of being super involved? Healing. Like, Healing. You no, know, you were there in the Holocaust. You're in that carriage now, and you know, is that really healthy, or is that really helping? And but what other choice do we have in the landscape of everything else that is so entertaining? We kind of all have to um, participate or disappear because no one's going to go to a museum that is just like, you know, <laughs> typewritten manuscripts pinned to the wall i would know? go to that museum but i know, so <laughs> I'm not, but, you know. but i would also say and this but, is an area where you know where we talked about this previously and i hope we can get there in the next conversation about the zapruder film and the idea of you know the recreation attempt to recreate the kennedy assassination and i mean the zapruder film is obviously the the film of the assassination is authentic but later efforts to um, reconstruct it and create that feeling again and relive it in some way or watch the film over and over and over again to attain a kind of emotional connection. And I think that's part of what you're talking about. It, it, it exists across historical periods um, and historical events. And it, it is a very peculiar and, and interesting phenomenon, I think. But now we're mostly talking about next next time. So yes. do we, should yeah. we have questions, Stephen? Is that yeah. still possible? Yeah, thank you, Simon. So uh, we're coming up on at uh, one o'clock Central Standard Time. Um, so, and, and as, as all of our panelists have alluded to, we are very excited that this, this discussion will continue uh, February 19th. Uh, we, again, it'll be a Friday um, at noon, same time. We will send out information both through the Blaffer and the Holocaust Museum. And obviously we will get much more into, I think, restagings, reenactments, popularizations, number of the questions that have been raised today. Um, but I do, I, and I wanna respect that people have to go back or uh, leave us at one. Um, thank you for joining us, but we do have, now have a little bit of time for a question and answer from the audience. Um, so- Can I ask like, a question to the oh, audience? Yeah. Okay, so my <laughs> the audience is, Based on what you've heard today and what you've seen Simon present and whether or not, <clears throat> excuse me, you have seen this exhibit, how would your response to it be different in the fact that it's housed at the Blaffer, which is an art museum, or if it had been housed at Holocaust Museum Houston or another Holocaust institution? Would it have been different? And, and, and I would like you to, to think about that um, before we come back together on February 19th, because I think that for me, that's been a question that has been sort of resonating and coming up again and again and again in my mind. And I would love to have Simon's exhibit in our museum. So. <laughs> I would actually, I would love to, I would love, it would be a dream to do it, to show it outside of a purely contemporary art context and in a context like that, simply because I think people come to, um, Holocaust museums with a very clear sense that you're going to get something very yeah. sincere, you know, yeah. and my exhibition is sincere, don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. but you have to, there's a certain kind of audience that goes to Holocaust Museum, which is educational first. Mm -hmm. And I think to present something in this manner, which is ultimately educational in many ways, um, I just don't know many directors that would be brave <laughs> enough. Yeah, but anyhow. I'm sorry, Stephen, I just, I- Oh, no, thank you. <laughs>
Well, I do. Um, yes, I want to open it up to the audience. If, you, if you'd like to answer Mary Lee's um, question or if you have another question. Um, I have a question. Yes, Jerry. Um, first of all, thank you for the entire panel for this very enlightening discussion. Um, I'm going to address this question to Alex um, and ask you to speculate. What do you think that Anne would have made of social media today? <laughs> um, I think Anne Frank would have loved social media. I think, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know. But I mean, she was a child of her time. You know, she was very, um, you know, in tune with, with her moment. She was somebody who wanted to be famous as a writer to be sure, but um, I think, um, and I don't think, I don't think, I mean, gosh, the question of social media is so complicated and it has such, such uh, drawbacks and yet certain things that are, that can be so great about it. Mm -hmm. um, it's can I interject with this? Sorry. For yeah, one sure, sure. Because I think the answer to your question already kind of exists because unfortunately you can't see it in America, but the Anne Frank House produced mm -hmm. um, something called Anne Frank's Video Diaries, which asks exactly in a similar way the question you're asking, which is what if Anne Frank had a camera as opposed to a book? So Anne Frank, you've experienced the Anne Frank Diaries as a series of vlogs, video diaries which you assume were kind of intended to be posted online. They're very kind of like, hi guys, you know, mum's really <laughs> annoying today, you know, and it's all filmed in this, in this method. So I think that question that you have is, is a question that, what's, what's interests me the most is that exact question, which is kind of a titillating, no offense, but slightly gossipy question. Like what would Anne Frank have done? You know, <laughs> is like, um, is is something that even the Anne Frank House, who are the gatekeepers of all morality and respect around Anne Frank, have gone, well, people really would love to know that as well. Yeah. So let's capitalize on that and but let's see what it looks like. And you know, then they have her blogging, vlogging. It's interesting because I think her, I mean, when I think across the landscape of diaries of teenagers who wrote during the Holocaust, I mean, I think many of them I would say. You know, if you ask me the same question about Yitzhak Rudashevsky, who was a diarist in Vilna, I would say there's no, he wouldn't have been interested in social media in the least. I mean, it depends on, it's the way that the writer, the sense of them that you get from their diary. And mm -hmm. she, you know, I think it, it's, an, it's an interesting, I mean, it's an interesting question. I find most of these kinds of recreations to be trivializing. I'm very uncomfortable with them. Um, but this goes back to Simon's and, you know, this goes back to this ongoing conversation about sort of, it's the two sides of the coin, you know, mm -hmm. what makes it accessible and what makes it potentially a useful tool is also what can um, strip away some of the meaning and the complexity of it. So it, it quickly gets very complicated. And so Jerry, I want to also speak on your question. I think about Anne waiting to get her magazines about Hollywood and the mm -hmm. actresses and the people she emulated. And in that way, I can see her gravitating towards social media um, and the fact of expressing her ideas to other people yeah. in a way that would get them out there. That appeals to um, many, many young people. Yeah. of that age. And I think in that time, I, I just, I think her personality would have been um, very well suited to. It's certainly how it strikes me, yeah. Yeah. Good question, Jerry. <laughs> Great, do we, have, do we have other questions from the audience? Uh, yes, uh, I would ask um, a question. From Emily and then Sandra, yeah. Okay, so. A diary is about words, it's about linguistic, and as you talked about it, um, nowadays it's all visual. So for me, it's also related to the fact that you, you transform history. You, you are not using words any, 
anymore. So you, you, you are talking about a diary, but like in the exhibition, you have a blank diary. So my thinking is, or my question more, is what do you think about the loss of linguistic? And what do you think about the loss of historical truth? because you lose the linguistic, the real words. And in the future, do you think, because writing something you can write anywhere, but if you don't have any energy or anything, you can't take a selfie, you can't record a video. So in the future, will we be able to steal um, testimony about the situation because the words will be lost? We'll let Simon answer that his, from the point of view of the exhibition first and then. Um, I'm so bad at thinking about the future. <laughs> like, I don't even know what that means. I never have, you know, I like, I mean, I know how like exciting it is to talk about it, but I always feel like I'm lying if I say anything about it. Um, I also, I'm really bad at lamenting the loss of anything. So, I mean, like I, I love writing and reading and, I love text and basically no one else does anymore in the next generation. <laughs> like, you know, but that's, I, I, I don't know if I should feel sad about that or not. So then I go, but you know what they are good at is visual culture. It's like anyone that I know who's like 20 can read an image and go, that scarf that that person's wearing, I know why they're wearing that because it signifies that and the kind of lighting they've chosen and what they're doing and the way it's back, like they are like a major, like PhD art historians of like their own images by self-educating. And this is like all kids now, they know pictures, they know what they mean. So there's a different kind of intelligence, which is useful to them and is maybe fleeting. I don't know how you record that or how that becomes important, but I, I like to think that that is, something that, that is a skill that's been developed. And I notice it in the, in when I teach young people and when I'm around family that's young, you know, they just, they just have a, a instant intelligence about things in the visual world, which my generation didn't have, we have to learn it, you know? Um, and there's a knowledge of, of how fictitious things are and how constructed things are then because they know how pictures are made. So there's a certain power and agency to that, which I think will, hopefully carry that generation through as we go into this picture generation where everything is completely fake and we go into deep fakes. There's like at least some like armoring, you know, like at least as a generation that like go like, well, I know how these pictures are made now and I know not to trust them. What that means for text, I don't know. Yes. And I would just push back a little bit on the idea that, that, you know, text is dead. I mean, <laughs> was that what you were going to say, Mary Lee? No, yes and no, but yeah. I mean, just just to say that um, text is changed, you mm -hmm. know, for sure, the sort of handwritten manuscript diary, the kind of records that we have from World War II and the Holocaust are not as common, but language is still being used. It's mm -hmm. it is abbreviated. There are emojis. There are, um, you know, sort of shortened phrases, IRL, you know, in real life or LOL, it, language changes. But, you know, I, I don't think that means that it's gone. And I think, you know, just in the way that people lamented the end of letter writing because of email, then text, because email was going away, you know, then Snapchat because texting was going away. I mean, this is an evolutionary process. And I, I agree, personally- I agree with you. In um, the sense, also, when you look at, like, um, what has become important literature today, you know, there's these huge epic sagas, like the Knoskard yeah. series or the Ferrante novels that are, like, six, seven parts, each book a thousand pages, and these are, like, the bestsellers suddenly. But in our, also, so there's, always, there's, there's always a counter-argument to it as well. We're also pushing against, I mean, Mary Lee and I are working in this exact area to push against this idea that you know, that, that writing of diaries or keeping records of daily life, you know, has to be um, sort of, that, that it is by definition a thing of the past. I think there's room for that to still exist. It's just that the conditions 
need to be created for that. And Mary Lee, yeah. I want to let you speak. I, and I wanted to say what I what I was going to say in response to this really interesting um, perspective and directive is that um, 20 some years ago where you were working on salvage pages, I was working on writing a dissertation that was about um, communication between young people. And I got really, really, really into the semiotic idea of hypertext, which at that point was a term that nobody knew. Now it's how we live in the world. Um, and I, I was thinking about that because this morning before I, our call, I was working on the concept paper that we'll be submitting for many, many, many dollars to support this project that we're doing. And part of what I was writing about was the collection of new writing by young people. And I put a sentence in there, something like, and the criterion for admission uh, will be decided by the overall project because I didn't know how the heck to say that we are open to text and we are open to visuals and we are open to things that have not even been created yet. Because in the, in the three years or five years that it's gonna take us to do this project, we don't know, as Simon said, we don't know what's gonna, what's gonna be present in, in this world. But I don't think as human beings, I just, I, I just want to believe that we will never, ever, ever be able to use, lose our connection to text. Can I say one last thing? I know we're running short on time, but I, I love this question and I love this part of the conversation. And it always reminds me, I don't know if anybody out there ever read the wonderful Mary Renault novel, The Praise Singer, but I always think of it when this comes up, it's, it's, it's about basically the, the loss of the oral tradition of reciting Homer and the transition to writing it down and how traumatic it was. The idea that the writing of, the preservation of Homer in writing Which represented this terrible loss of the oral tradition. And so I think it just, I always think of that in that it speaks to this ever-changing way in which we communicate, in which we understand ourselves, there's always a loss, there's always a gain, and we don't really know what it is in the moment, you know, but we're looking back at what's familiar and fearing that it's going to slip away and not sure yet what that new form might, might yield. And so I think it's, it's a great question and interesting uh, thing to think about. Great. So let's um, let's have, and I, I encourage you. Um, there's also some great comments in the in the chat box. Um, thank you, Amanda, for mentioning about meme culture. Yeah. Um, but we wanted to. I wanted if, if Sandra is still here. Oh, she might have just left. Yeah, she had to go. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe we will uh, we'll wrap up then. Um, but I very very much want to thank all of you for being here today. Uh, this talk has been recorded and it will be archived on the Blaffer's YouTube page. Um, and I also please tell everyone um, that you would like to invite to the next talk. Obviously, these are great panelists and I very, very much thank Simon, Alex and Mary Lee. Um, and we are so looking forward to the next chapter of this, this discussion. So please tune in, have your questions ready um, and we will see you again soon. Thanks for having us. Thanks, thank everyone. you. Thank you. Thank you.